So welcome back. I hope you are suitably caffeinated um, and ready to go for the next session. I would like to um, introduce Stefan, who has, um, who's in town from Sweden, shall we say. Stefan's a strategist and concept developer um, who's going to talk about how technological change is transforming how we um, create and process services um, and how big data will have an effect on the innovations that we can create and foresee in hospitality for the future. So Stefan, please. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Stefan Gaines. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I co-founded Aventurit, which is a service design agency based in Stockholm. And my job there is creative technologist. I basically get to play with new technologies and see if there's any way that we get put these to use for our clients. The talk I've been asked to uh, give today is on decoding minds, curating new lives and communities with smart analytics. Now, the way I'd like to do this is break my talk into four different parts. Uh, the first part, what I'd like to do is discuss these new minds, this new demographic, these millennials, what differentiates them from previous groups. And then what I'd like to do is discuss the new technologies that are coming online um, and how they enable these new behaviors and these new services that we're looking, that we're looking at. Third, I'd like to discuss new strategies, how are companies using these new technologies to reach this new demographic, these millennials. And finally, I'd like to look a little briefly at what's next, uh, what opportunities remain, uh, what does the future hold. So that's my talk. I have quite a few slides to go through, so we'll just uh, get started. First, these new minds. Now, they've been called many different things, digital natives, millennials, generation Y, generation next. But actually, as Araki said, what this really is is a new mindset. Uh, traditionally, people always say, these are all the people that have been born after 1982. But I feel that myself, I also am uh, part of this new mindset, and I definitely was not born after 1982. So what differentiates uh, millennials, uh, the digital natives, if you like? Well, I think there are three main characteristics. The first, and it's kind of obvious, uh, they are mobile native. Not anymore just digital natives, uh, but the center of their lives, center of my life, your life probably, is the mobile phone, the smartphone. And this basically is a new way in which we mediate pretty much with any kind of service these days. Um, so this is a, a really a new development in the last couple of years. Um, even in 2010, smartphones were relatively new. So this is something brand, brand new. Second, I think uh, digital natives uh, tend to be far more globally oriented. And they think of the world's problem in a holistic way. And this is often environmental problems. So I think there is an ecological mindset that is part and parcel of the digital natives. Uh, so there's a willingness to be more environmental, more caring of the environment, more willing to share uh, things in order to uh, lower the footprint. And finally, I think digital natives are post-materialistic. And this is a little bit more complicated to explain, so I'm gonna spend a few slides on this. What do I mean by post-materialistic? I don't mean post-status. I think we all still crave status. Uh, but status is no longer really uh, gained through displaying wealth, uh, displays of wealth. So, uh, you know, the person who dies with the most toys wins. This kind of idea is out the window. It's too how. Um, and so instead, status becomes something that you gain by getting, being able to show that you are creative, being able to show that you are authentic, uh, by being able to show you have access to leisure, um, and by collecting experiences, by having a wealth of experience. This becomes the uh, new definition uh, of status. So in a way, what you're now doing is collecting experiences instead of collecting things. Things are still interesting and useful, uh, but they are a means to an end. They are as useful, they are so useful as they are in order to achieve experiences and gain experiences. So the person with dies with the best memories these days wins. Um, if the focus is on experiences rather than things, then the focus is more on access to things in order to have these experiences rather than wanting or needing to own these things. Ownership now uh, moves towards access. Um, so one example is music. We used to buy records or CDs, and then we moved on to digital versions of this in iTunes. But these days, I haven't bought a single song since 2007 when I started using Spotify. Uh, or Pandora, there's lots of other services like this. And basically what I'm buying now is access to music. And I think this is far better because I have access to every single piece of music rather than just the ones that I supposedly owned before. 
Um, if you look at the same thing with cars, so you know you used to have to own a car if you wanted to go from A to B. But transportation these days is you can have Uber, you can have taxis, you can have uh, many different ways. So there's this whole disaggregation of the concept of ownership, and it's being repurposed in the idea of this now that these goods, these things are being servicized. This is a Harvard Business School idea that uh, we use things for the services that they provide rather than just wanting to own them. So, but where does post-materialism thrive? Now, it's gained hold in some countries more than others, and I think one reason uh, why it's interesting and that we've noticed is perhaps in Sweden um, is because of the following slide. Uh, one way that you measure materialism is whether people agree with the statement, I measure my success by the things I own. Now, when uh, Ipsos, a huge polling agency, did this, they, they asked tens of thousands of people around the world late last year, uh, in Sweden, only 7% of the people agreed that I measure my success by the things I own. Uh, on the other end of the scale right now is mainland China, with 71% agreed with I measure success by the things I own. So in this sense, post-materialism is something that's gained hold already in uh, Sweden, uh, where it, this is, I guess, we are extreme post-materialists. Now the question is, why is this different? Well, where does this difference come from? Is it a cultural difference? Is it because there is a, uh, you know, a very high income inequality? Uh, in Sweden, it's low income inequality. Actually, no. Uh, the biggest correlation is between per capita GDP and materialism. So if you look here on the slide, on the left, you can see, for example, Sweden has a high per capita. So the, 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 the collective wealth of the country uh, is quite high. Uh, and this correlates with low materialism, uh, while mainland China, it's still developing. So the, what I want to show with the slide is as countries on the bottom right uh, basically uh, become wealthier and develop, you'll see that they also become less materialistic. So post-materialism in Sweden at the moment is a little bit, if you like, the avant-garde. And I think the rest of the world will progressively become less and less materialistic uh, as, as it develops. Are there any implications for brand equity? I would argue yes. Uh, I think we're seeing a preference, a, a shift of preference for luxury goods and services to premium goods and services. And I'll explain what the difference is between these two as far as I uh, perceive it. Luxury goods and services, um, brand value there is derived from the scarcity of the material, the scarcity of the workmanship, the scarcity of the resulting product, whether it's you know, a Prada bag or so on, uh, and the resulting exclusivity of that product. So only very few people can have it. Um, and that is the, where the brand value is derived from. Premium goods, on the other hand, derive their value from the function that they provide, the way that they can enhance your creativity or your experiences. And often this kind of product uh, derives that function from technology. So if you get to choose here between a diamond encrusted gold plated Virtu phone, which I think costs something like 6,000 US dollars, or an iPhone for $800, the iPhone does far, far more. The Virtu phone is basically just a feature phone. I, I would choose the iPhone um, every time. So this is the difference. Uh, the technology of the iPhone is far more interesting than the luxury aspect of a Virtu phone. So just to sum up, the more technology contributes to brand value, the less that exclusivity uh, has to say about that, that brand value. Um, in sum, so the digital natives, what do they want? They want it to be authentic. They are focusing on experiences rather than things, rather than, say, luxury goods. That's my take. Maybe it's a little bit extreme, and I'm not saying that everybody suddenly is like this, but if you, I think we're seeing a gradual shift in this direction. This is great for the travel industry because the travel industry, their job is to manufacture experiences. Traveling is really just a, a memory generation machine. Uh, so that's great. but. If the travel industry wants to attract digital natives, you need to use digital tools. Mobile natives require mobile tools. So what are these tools? Well, funny you should ask, because that's the second part of my talk, these new technologies. Um, it can be very overwhelming when you talk about new technologies. What are, you know, there's so many of them. Uh, where do you even begin? Well, one way that you could do this is by uh, trying to structure them a little bit. So, there are these raw technologies that engineers like to talk about, and it's very, very fundamental. So it's systems on a chip, new, you know, new field communications, and that sort of stuff. Uh, but these technologies underlie the kind of enabling technologies, big data, mobile phones, wearable technology, which in turn uh, allow social technologies, the, the technologies that influence our behavior, 
the, the technologies that we interact with. And you can draw all these lines, you know, so cloud computing enables big data and so on. But I'm going to get rid of raw technologies because that's not really interesting just today and look instead at social technologies. And what's interesting is that every single implementation of these technologies, you know, so the sharing economy, economies, Uber and Airbnb, et cetera, all of these crowdsourcing, Internet of Things, all are grounded, are founded uh, on big data. And this is a, a very big shift. So it's time to talk about big data now. Um, big data has been around for about a decade. Uh, that's when Google first released a software that allows you to manipulate uh, huge data sets, uh, MapReduce. Uh, Google came out with Hadoop and, and a scripting language called Pig, 2004, 2006. But it was only in around 2010 that uh, the term big data started being used as something that everybody goes, oh, look, here's a trend, big data. So it's only a few years ago that people recognize that this is going on, but it's actually been going on for much longer. Um, one prerequisite for big data is the digitalization of society. Now, this has been going on for the last 15, 20 years, but it is a huge, huge shift from anything that went on before in the history of civilization. Um, every single um, in transaction these days is digital in some way. Finance, from health, e-government, manufacturing, airlines, hotel bookings, all that sort of stuff. Everything we do is somehow mediated almost everything, uh, unless you're buying you know, with cash at a local market, uh, has a digital trail. And this digital trail, so whether you're clicking on something or liking something or uh, calling somebody, all that sort of stuff, this is the raw stuff of big data. This is very much, when you're looking at uh, consumer products and so on, the, the oil that runs uh, big data. Uh, for example, even when you type errors. Uh, Google uses this for its spell checking. So next time you type a mistake in Google search, it will actually know. It's amazing how it knows. Did you mean this instead? And that's basically even all, you know, the data exhaust, everything that all these signals that you leave off, even the wrong signals. Uh, what makes big data big? What is the difference between big data and small data? Well, it's not any one thing. Uh, many factors determine if data is big. And if your data uh, fits some of these factors, then probably what you're handling is big data. So we're going to go through six or seven of these right now. Uh, there's been a shift uh, from centralized computing to cloud-based computing. If you're using cloud-based computers, um, you're probably dealing with big data. This is a prerequisite for big data because big data sets are so huge that one computer can no longer handle them. Instead, you have to break up the work into lots of different onto different computers. Uh, Amazon provides this service, Google, Microsoft. They used to use them internally, and then they productified it, and now they sell it to anybody. Uh, it's very scalable, very flexible, very cheap, because you only pay what you use for. Uh, and Airbnb was basically just built by getting an account on Amazon EC2 and getting to work. Uh, instead of playing with just some data sets, small data sets, um, you can now try and play with all the data, collect all the data. So you might have just before had customers, and that's you know, a very manageable file. Now we're looking at every single book ever published in the English language, which is what Google's been scanning, or every single search ever performed in the last say, year to look for, for example, uh, if people are searching for I have the flu or flu symptoms and that sort of stuff to try and, and predict flu trends. So there's a huge shift in scale. And if you have all the data, your data does not have to be clean anymore. So if you're doing a sample or if you're doing an opinion poll, you have to make sure that this data is accurate because you're just sampling bits of data. But if you have all the data, then it doesn't really matter anymore. So uh, for example, a company called Price Stats, they measure inflation. What they do is they scrape prices off the entire internet every single day. And sometimes this data is a little bit wrong, a little bit messy, but in every case, it, because there's so much of it, that's far better than trying to make sure that the data is completely accurate. Uh, a huge shift from structured data, so you might have played with Excel file sheets, uh, Excel, Excel spreadsheets, or FileMaker and so on, you know, where everything's neat in column and so on. These days, data doesn't fit into columns anymore. It can be video, it can be audio, it can be maps, it can be any kind of stuff. It's very, very uh, unstructured. And so all the software that handles big data actually can handle this kind of unstructured data. This is a very big shift as well. Uh, people, when you used to play with data, you, you would have a hypothesis. For example, you would say, I think people who like jazz also like classical music. Let's see if that's true. 
These days, you don't ask questions like that anymore. You use software that automatically finds correlations, and that's how Amazon does it. So when you buy something on Amazon, they say, oh, people who bought this book also bought that book. That's this machine learning that basically doesn't know, doesn't care why uh, there's a correlation. It just says there is a correlation, and often it's uncanny how accurate and how useful that correlation is. Um, before, it was much more being, you know, people were playing with static data. These days, people really, really also love to play with live data. So the entire Twitter feed, the, the fire hose of Twitter, gets mined by companies for sentiment analysis. Are people positive today, negative today, positive about Apple, negative about Apple? And then they use this information live to do trading uh, on stocks and so on. Um, the global distribution system of, of, that airlines use uh, for seat availability, so that if you book your ticket, uh, somebody else doesn't also book the ticket. That is updated live, and that's a huge, huge uh, big data system. And finally, uh, big data used to be only used for, or data used to be only used for one purpose. For example, uh, you know the, the the location of your phone in order to make your phone work can now be reused for lots of other purposes. And one big example is the Danish Cancer Society a few years ago uh, decided to use all cell phone records of all Danes over all time, and then all instances of cancer of all Danes of all time, and mash these up together. And th those data sets were not used for this purpose to find if there's a correlation between cell phone usage and cancer. And they found, no, there isn't any. Um, anyway, that's just an aside. So but that's an example of, of reusing data. So we see big data underlying the sharing economy, mobile social apps, crowdsourcing, augmented reality, quantified self, you know, when you have all sensors on your own body, Internet of Things when there's sensors in uh, all the items around you. The question now I want to ask is how are companies using these technologies to connect back to the uh, digital natives, the millennials? And that's the part, third part of my talk. So before we go into some, I have like six or seven strategies that companies have been using. Before I go on to this, I want to make sure that we have this straight. If you are not mobile friendly, or your website isn't mobile friendly, if you don't have an app or so on, you're becoming increasingly irrelevant uh, because that is the main way in which people are going to try and access your services uh, via the mobile. So with that out of the way, let's have a look at some strategies. Of course, Airbnb is the 800 pound gorilla. Um, in this day, and Uber and uh, another company, Viable, which I'll get to in a second, they uh, have exploited the sharing economy concept. Now, the sharing economy is a bit of a misnomer. There is actually not that much sharing about it. It's actually monetizing Slack in an economy. So Airbnb, for example, found, figured out a way that people with spare rooms can monetize their spare room. Uh, Uber found a way of giving people with spare time and a car a way of making money. And Viable is a company that found people, local people who have local knowledge, who want to act as guides and have spare time, a way of uh, giving their guiding services to local visitors. Um, I'm just going to focus a little bit on Airbnb because I love Airbnb. They have uh, amazing, authentic experiences. Uh, I've stayed at all these four people's places uh, over the past year or two. And I know them now, and it's great. It really is a personal experience. Uh, when I travel, not for business, but when I travel for pleasure, I almost always uh, use Airbnb. I check Airbnb first, actually. Um, so I'm not alone. Uh, they, there's a, you know, they've, they've grown amazingly. Uh, what is amazing about them, too, is that this is a tweet from uh, one of the executives uh, of Airbnb uh, from a few days ago. One fifth of all people visiting Brazil for the World Cup are staying in Airbnb places. So that's that's quite an amazing uh, figure. The thing about Airbnb that is big data oriented, it's not just that it's built on Amazon EC2, so that the whole infrastructure is there. It's also that they use the social graph, social networking, Facebook and Twitter, as a way of building trust so that you know that the person who's coming to visit in your room or that you're going to go visit is not completely crazy. Uh, you can see that they have you know, 500 friends, or maybe you even have friends in common. So they use big data in many different ways to provide uh, the product or the service that they have. Another uh, strategy is to innovate on search. Now, this is a very crowded uh, region. There are, there are many, many competitors here. So I'm just going to focus on a few that have done some interesting uh, innovations in search. 
Um, first, all of these are meta search sites, which is interesting because what they do is they scrape the information from uh, online travel agents, um, and then they provide you the cheapest price, uh, or they find it for you. Uh, and then if, they, if there's a booking, they also share in the commission, of course. Um, Kayak here, what they've done is they've uh, scraped a lot of data, historical data, um, and tried to turn this into predictions on price. When will prices for the trip that you want to do go up or down, uh, which can be very useful. Uh, Hipmunk uh, has done a service where they basically try to add other criteria, uh, and I'll show you that in a second. While the Sudist is, that's more for geeks, they actually provide all the big data analytics at your fingertips so that you too can actually geek out and really find the, 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 you know, the spot that, that you think is, or the, the hotel room or so on that you think really fits you. Um, here you can quickly see uh, Hipmunk, they have this concept of the agony index, so you don't just uh, zoom on price, but you zoom on, you, you uh, look for, you know, uh, in this case, duration and number of stops as a, you know. You can also expand into new markets. Um, this is what Priceline did. Priceline is an online travel agency that spent the last 10 years or so building networks to hotels. Uh, so they have an amazing booking system uh, for hotels. And then last week, they bought um, OpenTable, which is a restaurant booking service. So they're repurposing their technology. They've achieved economies of scale um, in one industry, and now they're reusing it in another industry. So that's another strategy you can use. Uh, this one's interesting. You can own your own touch point. If you're a hotel, the problem is that every time that somebody uh, books via an online travel agency, they take 25% commission. So how do you increase uh, loyalty of the customer? How do you re increase repeat direct bookings? Well, one way that you can do this is by having an app, uh, making sure that you're on that person's mobile phone and making this app useful. Uh, so, for example, Zaplox has uh, cardless keys. You use your app as the as the key to your door, to your room door. And Premier Inn has this uh, thing where you can uh, automate your room. So they're using the Internet of Things. They're turning home automation and applying it to the hotel room. So here's, for example, Zaplox. You uh, get your hotel reservation. You uh, get the app. You check in. Uh, and this is you know, remotely, so you can, before you show up at the hotel. Uh, as a result, you get a key. And then when you're in front of the door, click the button unlock, your key's unlocked, your door's unlocked, and then you can share the key later as well. So this is a very interesting innovation. Uh, and then, of course, once this app is on your phone, you can use it to book the next time uh, because it's so convenient. So this is really trying to make the, the customer journey as seamless as possible and, as a result, being on the mobile phone. In Premier Inn, you can, for example, set the room temperature via your app. You can order a room service via the app. So they're really trying to innovate what uh, constitutes service uh, in a hotel context. You can try and own the customer journey. So yes, it's time to you know, book a flight. But maybe you're still only just in the inspiration phase. So Afar, for example, tries to capture you while you're in the inspiration phase and inspire you to actually book there and then. And then they get the commission. Expedia. You know, you might be looking for a flight, but they'll also try and sell you the hotel room, uh, rental cars, um, uh, local activities, and so on. So here's the Afar. So that's, uh, you know, they, they build themselves as a travel guide, but in fact, it's a, a booking site. Um, and of course, you probably know Expedia, but they, they basically try and capture everything. So you see the mobile phone, they were first doing flights, but now almost hotels are more important. And finally, own the conversation. This is not a strategy. Uh, TripAdvisor, which is not a huge, huge success, they, for some reason, have managed to be the watering hole for independent, objective customer reactions to hotels, uh, to, so much, to such an extent that hotels quake at the thought of a negative uh, you know, comment on TripAdvisor. So uh, if you have that conversation, if that's the place, if you become that watering hole, that is a fantastic asset to have. Um, yeah, here's TripAdvisor. So, what strategies are left? Well, there's different ways uh, you can go about that. Uh, this is a quick short section. One thing that I like to do is make a matrix. Um, put on one side all these new technologies, and then uh, on the top, put the customer journey. So here you can see what customers do before they travel, during travel, and after travel. And then on the left, all the technologies that you might try and exploit. So 
A lot of the companies that we've looked at today uh, fill a place somewhere on this. You can see that the search place using apps to book, for example, is quite crowded. Um, so the question becomes, uh, as, a, as a challenge, uh, could you occupy other places on this matrix that nobody has occupied before? For example, what about applying the sharing economy to restaurants? Would it be possible for amateur chefs who are good chefs to invite people over into their homes and cook meals for uh, money? Has it been done? I don't know. That might be an interesting place to, to try and build a new business idea. Or how about applying the quantified self to lodging where you know, your body temperature might determine the temperature of a hotel room automatically? Or what about here, uh, Internet of Things with activities? Or mashing up augmented reality in flight? What if you had uh, you know, virtual reality goggles instead of a small square uh, in front of your, your seat while you're flying 11 hours from you know, Sweden to Hong Kong? I, I, I think that would be great. Um, augmented reality when you know, serving as inspiration for a flight. Wouldn't that be interesting? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you could basically you know, build your own matrix. Uh, just also quickly, you can try and think outside the matrix. Are there any aspects of this customer journey that haven't been identified yet? Can you segment it into even smaller aspects, like cruises or so on, something else? Uh, are there new technologies that haven't been listed there? So for example, uh, new payment systems, uh, financial innovation like Bitcoin and so on. Are there ways that you can um, use these technologies? But whatever you do, this is my last slide, uh, just remember what we started with, which is a digital native and their values. Uh, and try to remember that everything you do should try and align with digital natives who are mobile native, have a global perspective, and are getting more and more post-materialistic. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Stephen, thank you. That's fascinating. Thanks. And a nice um, alternative perspective as well. Yeah. Great. Are there any questions from the audience? I can't see. I'll kick you off then if that's all right. Sure. Not kick you off the stage, but kick you <laughs> off with a question. Um, how do you resolve the tension between big data and authenticity? Mm. Well, um, big data is, can provide the, the, the infrastructure, the, the, the foundations for services that allow authenticity to bloom. So Airbnb is a very good example of that. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, even digital natives need to get a job, need to go on business trips. And when you're in that, so you know, in those cases, Airbnb is really out of the question. In those cases, I think you don't always, I don't always want authentic experiences when I'm in a business hotel. I want painless experiences. And this kind of seamlessness in you know, not having to wait in lines, not, you know, that, that kind of stuff, I think for me is also very valuable. And their big data can help relieve the pain so that the people that do work at a hotel can provide those authentic experiences, which are really personal experiences. And you know, to what extent, I, if, if somebody tells me, oh, hello, Stefan, and they know my name because they've been looking at you know, a computer screen that tells them when I call up room service, uh, that is not that impressive. So in that sense, I just want big data to relieve the pain and in those cases where authenticity is allowed to bloom, like in Airbnb, I'm very happy with that as well. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Uh, question over here, thank you. Hi, uh, I have a question. So we're getting the new service like Airbnb because uh, right now it's also a roused debate about it's, it's going to change the systems. Because at the meantime, you book a hotel, you pay tax and then the hotel have to pay tax. But if you hire Airbnb, both party can jump the tax. And this kind of services is going to change the whole structure of how government collect money. Mm -hmm. Do you think it will, it, will, it will make a big change in the future because the government is getting poor? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, there's a, Airbnb is fundamentally disruptive, right? I mean, they're already the third largest hotel chain if you're looking at available rooms and they've been around for a few years. Um, and this kind of disruption always generates the backlash. So it, not just here, but also in Los Angeles and New York, and some people are going, you know, what about zoning rules? What about noisy neighbors? All those kinds of things. And it's interesting that this is happening. And, but I think this is inevitable in a disruptive environment. And so you have this period of disruption, 
and then you have a period of accommodation where everybody comes up with new rules and regulations. It's a bit like Amazon when they first, with books, like they weren't paying tax. Now in the United States, they pay tax. So I think there will be systems that are developed. Uh, so instead of, you know, in some places locally, they'll try and ban Airbnb, which has been done. In other places, they'll go, okay, we'll regulate this. So yeah, you have to, you'll have to pay tax. You'll have to register yeah, as a small business and that sort of stuff. So I think that's what's gonna happen. So you push in one direction to disrupt and then you take a step back and you sort of like meet a middle ground. I think that's what's going on now with Airbnb. I think that's a fascinating question generally about yeah. all of this, right? I mean, Uber has the same issue. Right. Recently in, in London, the London black taxi cabs decided to, to go on strike, right? To protest against Uber. And they thought this would be great. Um, not realizing that actually it meant that Uber sales and, and bookings went up exponentially right. because you couldn't get a black cab in London. Right. So there you go. Right. Yeah. No, I, I, you know, when it's incumbents, let's say I, I, the hotels, I think, need to adapt. I, I, trying to ban Airbnb is not going to be the solution. Uh, trying to make Airbnb play fair, that's fair. Right. Um, so in that sense, the tax question specifically, I think I don't have any problems with Airbnb users and, and providers paying tax. <laughs> any any other questions in the audience? Okay, I, I have a, was there a, sure. no? I have another one for you. Um, does owning the customer journey through technology remove brand personality or add to it? Wow, I've never thought about that. <laughs> uh, brand personality. Yeah, like you said, it's so different. It's so difficult for a hotel chain these days to have a very specific personality, so Marriott or a hotel in Continental and so on. I guess if you are able to be first mover and use big data and, and the kind of analytics and so on to provide even better services, maybe on the margin I would choose them. But I, I think what it would take is, for example, what I would love is a room that automatically, I mean, I, I'm a, a sucker for new technology. So a room that integrates home automation, so the Internet of Things, so where all the things in my hotel room are smart, where it can read all the sensors on my body if I'm wearing wearables, so I'm thinking maybe five years from now. That kind of room I would book anytime. So that, if, if that kind of differentiation is available for, to the early movers, I think that would be fascinating. And then if you can be the high-tech hotel, I, I, I would love it. <laughs> is that making us more social or less social? I'm envisaging, I'm envisaging one of Andreas's drain pipes yeah. with you sitting there with all technology on you and staying <laughs> inside the thing. How, is this, is, is this? Yeah, I, I, don't think, I don't think technology makes us more or less social. I think we use technology to remain social. So whether you're using Air, you know, Facebook or uh, playing video games, I and mean, if you, even if you're playing World of Warcraft, you suddenly you're building clans. If you're in you know, Second Life, you're, you're talking to people. This is what people seek out. Right. despite or because of technology. I, I think in the long run, we're social animals. And so Sweet. in that sense, we'll always find a way of using technology to connect. Fantastic. I think that's a great note to end on, Stefan. Thank you very much thank you. for your talk. Thank you very much.